My name is Danny Lappin. I am the environmental planner with the Otsego County Conservation Association. And today I'm here to discuss the power of planning during and after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Okay. So uh, basically a few ground rules. Uh, the first one I wanted to add that's not actually on there is that I don't claim to have all the answers when it comes to the future of community planning um, in Otsego County and across New York State. Um, this is mainly an attempt by OCCA and myself to get the discussion started about how we reimagine our communities post COVID and how we can respond to um, future disasters of this scale. Um, and so it's just always a question, you know, kind of a open forum for discussion. So feel free to ask questions anytime. Um, if you don't feel comfortable stopping me, you can use the chat function and raise your hand and ask questions and Amy Wyatt, our executive director, will pass them on to you. If there are too many questions for us to answer, um, we will save the chat log and we will answer your questions in writing. Um, so just to make sure that nobody feels left out or that I'm ignoring you. And if you're not uh, asking a question, please mute your mic. I know that Zoom meetings can be suddenly interrupted by cats or you know slamming doors or run kids running around. Uh, so if you could keep yourself muted, that would be amazing. Thank you. And so um, we have four presentation objectives today. Um, the first is basically to have fun. Um, planning is, you know, traditionally, you know, people think planning is just looking at regulations, writing regulations, um, you know, sitting in boring meetings. But in reality, you know, planning can be a really fun topic to discuss. So I hope that we'll be able to have some fun today and uh, kind of uh, as we talk about uh, different planning approaches. And the second objective is to understand why planning is important post COVID, particularly in rural communities like Otsego County. Uh, number three is a typo, sorry. Um, the number three objective is to learn kind of what we can do moving forward. And finally, uh, I wanna talk about what you can do to be involved in the uh, post COVID uh, planning realm. And so for those of you who don't know, OCCA is a 501c3 nonprofit organization located in Springfield, New York. We have three full-time staff and four part-time staff. Um, we have three main program areas. We do a lot of environmental education and outreach, ranging from nature walks to uh, school-based lectures to community events where environmental experts from all over the state come and talk about their work. We, do a we have a research and monitoring arm, which involves um, doing a lot of citizen mo science monitoring, monitoring of aquatic and invest aquatic and terrestrial invasive species spread. And then finally, we have the policy and planning realm, which is my area, where we monitor state and federal policy developments and assist communities as needed with their environmental and community planning needs. And so who am I? I'm an in, I'm, we've kind of discussed this. I'm the environmental planner with the Otsego County Conservation Association. I am a... Uh, uh, AICP certified planner, um, which basically means I received a national certification from the American Planning Association. I was hired in 2014 and I, my background is in environmental policy and environmental science. And so OCCA, we kind of went over what we do, um, but here's kind of a pictures of us in action. You see our education programs, research and monitoring programs and us in the halls of Congress with our New York 19 representative Antonio Delgado discussing um, uh, uh, federal policy related to the Chesapeake Bay. And so, you know, kind of broadly, you know, I wanted to start off this talk by going over kind of what the COVID pandemic has taught us so far. Um, and the first lesson is that, you know, especially in rural communities and all across the United States is that broadband for all is essential. Um, with the change in uh, working culture from um, you know, people going to the office every day to now uh, a large portion of America's workforce working from home, it's imperative that we all have broadband access. And this is particularly important if you have children who are of school age and rely on online um, systems and uh, platforms to submit your work. And according to a recent study from Broadband Now in 2018, um, 42 mi million Americans do not have access to broadband. And this is kind of a stark number, um, primarily because um, if the post-COVID conversation is shifting to moving things online, 
there's a large segment of our population that could be left behind unless our country and our state and local leaders invest properly in the provision of broadband internet. The uh, second lesson is that we must enhance coordination across all levels of government. What we've seen from the coronavirus pandemic is that uh, an incredible strain placed on the ability of local governments from your town, village, or county to the state government, to the federal government, a very difficult time um, communicating in light of a rapidly changing and evolving crisis at a national scale. And that's a really um, important thing to keep in mind because when uh, county governments provide services, for instance, a large portion of the money for those services comes from uh, state grants or state resources, which come are enabled federally by federal legislation and uh, with the money being appropriated by the United States Congress. Um, and so in order to adapt, you need kind of this, you know, chain effect of every level of government kind of being able to respond quickly to you know, uh, an evolving uh, landscape. And I think that's a really important lesson if we're going to um, you know, survive and adapt to the post-COVID world, um, coordination across all levels of government must improve. And um, you know, when we talk about improvement, um, there is a need to innovate. Um, traditionally, the United States has led the global uh, stage in terms of innovation, in terms of coming up with new technology and new ideas. But a recent uh, Bloomberg poll and um, showed that the United States is the ninth most innovative country in the world. Um, other planning firms such as City Fi have been talking about this issue. And the reason why this is important is that um, when we talk about uh, becoming a resilient society, we must be able to adapt to new situations. And in order to adapt, we need to innovate new approaches to community planning and economic development, growth, the provision of services, provision of education, you know, basically everything. Um, and so when it comes to innovation, that is a key component of our uh, uh, sustained future success. And so kind of, you know, the question, uh, the pandemic has raised several questions as well. Um, within, with respect to planning, uh, there's discussion about whether the dense bustling, um, you know, active cities of today, such as New York City, Boston, San Francisco, Seattle, is, our, is the uh, approach to plan dense, vibrant communities the right thing or the wrong thing? And planners are divided on this issue. There are some who believe that more social distancing is the right way to go, while others believe that maintaining the current approach of new urbanism, focusing on dense transit-oriented development that provides affordable housing and uh, walk, you know, access to jobs and limits traffic congestion is still kind of the way to go. And so that debate is ongoing and evolving and it's important to pay attention to if you are a planning official or if you are uh, a community leader or a volunteer um, in your community. It's important to kind of keep that debate in your mind and to evaluate both sides of the issue. And so the second question is I mean, what could we have done differently? Um, right now, that's a question that's being asked all the time. And unfortunately, we're not gonna know the answer until you know, a couple, several years down the road when this pandemic has ceased. But it's always important to start evaluating um, your approach, start thinking about what could have been done differently at other stages and start amassing information so that your uh, government, your town, your village, your organization, your agency is prepared to respond um, should a second wave of COVID-19 cases arise. And then finally, the third question is kind of how do we bounce back? What does the uh, economic recovery look like? Um, what businesses will reopen? What will stay closed? How do we um, you know, encourage confidence in our county's uh, tourism sector? How do we um, bounce back if we're relying on sales tax when people are uh, losing their jobs and unable to make purchases? I think those are all really important questions that we must consider. And lastly, but not least, um, what is the new normal? You know, everyone says the new normal is going to be this or the new normal is going to be that. Um, you know, trying to figure out what that's going to be is going to be a key question for us to, to tackle collectively um, as we work together throughout uh, the state. And so I kind of wanted to bring this up um, just earlier today. I was on a county board of representatives meeting. 
and you know we uh, our treasurer um, shared us uh, shared with us this report from the National Association of Counties, and it shows the uh, impact of the COVID nineteen pandemic on local governments. And according to you know there this infographic, you'll see that. Um, the unemployment rate in April is 14.7% nationwide and 20.5 million jobs were lost in April and more than 800,000 of those jobs were in the local government sector. Um, and, you know, when we look at the overall budgetary impact to counties, we see a $144 billion um, anticipated impact to counties nationwide. And so that's, you know, a very kind of stark bleak picture. Uh, counties are responsible for providing uh, social services, uh, protection uh, from public health uh, crises. Uh, they assist with planning and transportation and in some areas, solid waste management. Um, they, you know, pave our roads. They, you know, um, the sheriff's department protects our public safety. Um, all of these issues are very, um, you know, kind of important to pay attention to when you see these large scale budgetary impacts and the resultant cuts that come from that. So the um, 800,000 number also includes jobs lost from city and county education systems. So the school local governments are deeply connected with the school boards. Um, if the people are not paying their taxes, it falls on county governments in New York State to make the school districts whole. And if there are cash flow problems, there's a, a very high risk of a cascading effect across uh, many government sectors. And so how has the pandemic affected us in Otsego County? Um, the most current numbers I have are from uh, April. And so Otsego County is heavily dependent on sales tax. Um, so how dependent are we? 37% um, of our uh, revenue comes from sales tax. And the COVID pandemic, based according to the New York State Association of Counties latest projections, there's a potential forecasted decline of 10 to 25% in sales tax revenue. Um, it's important to realize that this is just an estimate. These numbers are subject to change. The landscape is changing rapidly. But in term, from a planning perspective, this is the kind of impact that we need to be bracing for um, to at least staunch the bleeding for now. Um, as of April 18, 2020, 2,292 unemployment claims have been filed in Otsego County. And for a reference point, this is up uh, 18.2 times from the same time period in 2019. And again, this is according to the same New York State Association of Counties report. And, and kind of resultant from that, you know, as we've discussed earlier, um, you know, according to Google mobility data, um, approximately 53%, uh, there's been an approximately 53% decline in visits to retail and restaurant establishments in Otsego County. Um, this is again an estimate the uh, Google uses their uh, smartphone data and location tracking features to um, collect this there is if you search Google mobility data on online you can see that they've been doing that to um, evaluate the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so again, this is just an estimate, um, but it shows, you know, a, a steep decline in an area that our county relies heavily upon. And so kind of, you know, why is planning important post COVID? Um, you know, and it's important to kind of remember that in my opinion, anybody can be a planner. Anybody interested in sharing ideas with your community and getting involved in local government can be a planner. So um, the first reason why I would argue that planners are important are that planners are experimenters. Um, when a city like Oneonta talks about revitalizing its downtown, um, you know, they first have to develop a plan and they have to propose a series of ideas that may or may not work. And over the course of the last several years, the city has kind of adapted programs that are successful, such as the upper floor renovations on Main Street. And then they've also um, begun um, rebranding and remarketing themselves and trying out a new approach to, you know, portray Oneonta as a place for young people to come and locate. Um, planners are also conveners. Um, you know, there are, there's this book out there and you have to forgive me because I forget the author's name, but it's called The Big Sort. And the book's thesis is that people will self-segregate based on ideology, based on beliefs, and tend to live close to people who they agree with or interact with people who they agree with and kind of avoid people they don't agree with. 
um, planners are, you know, tasked with the responsibility of bringing everybody together, whether or not they agree on an issue or not. In fact, the strongest plans are ones that are kind of crafted by, you know, a thorough discussion, thorough debate of the issues, and as opposed to kind of a homogenous approach to solving a problem. And lastly, planners are problem solvers. Um, you know, it's our job as planners, you know, as, as citizens and members of local government to come up with creative solutions um, to our municipal, uh, urban, uh, rural uh, problems. And some of those involve, you know, as we see here, um, planners, you know, have started to use virtual reality to, uh, as far for public engagement purposes. Uh, the capital of Lithuania, Vilnius, has, um, you know, delegated a lot of its uh, city space to an open air cafe. And, you know, the city of Oakland has closed off a lot of its streets um, to car traffic in favor of multimodal transportation, walking, biking, scootering, uh, et cetera. And these are all kind of approaches to solving, you know, the problem of, um, you know, that COVID-19 poses with respect to social distancing. And so when it comes to planning, you know, it's not just planners who are the uh, arbiter of every decision. Um, oftentimes there are several levels of, you know, individuals who play key roles um, in helping planners achieve their vision. Uh, the federal and state government is kind of at the top. The county governments are, you know, follow beneath them, local governments such as your town or village, uh, the business community and the public. So if you were to think, look at it from a hierarchical perspective, the public would be at the top, followed by, you know, the, the business community and then the local government, county government, so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, over the next couple of slides, I'll be kind of discussing, you know, the role that each level of government all the way down to the public can play um, in planning a post COVID-19 um, world. And so, you know, state governments, you know, their main role in terms of implementing plans, in terms of helping people adapt are to get resources from point A to point B. Um, think of, you know, the uh, stimulus being package being debated in the House of Representatives and the US Senate right now. Um, a lot of that money um, is intended to help local state and local governments provide essential services um, to their constituents um, and to help um, and, you, know, um, you know, Americans all throughout the country get by over the next uh, several months. And you know, that kind of goes into the next role, which is to coordinate a large scale response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in this case, you know, you have to think of the phrase herding cats. Um, the federal government is responsible for coordinating, you know, pandemic responses um, with all 50 states to make sure everybody's kind of working together, sharing information on more or less the same page. And they're also kind of responsible for coordinating all of the multitude of federal agencies and departments um, and making sure that they follow similar, you know, uh, proper protocols. And so that's a very kind of challenging um, uh, kind of aspect or picture, but then, you know, without that level of coordination, um, that kind of permeates down to each successive level of government and makes it much harder um, for us all to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, you know, the role of state and federal governments is to maintain and provide essential services to the public. Um, you know, and so kind of what does this mean? You know, we've had a long discussion at, at, about this at the county level, and there are services that are mandated by law that local governments and state governments must provide um, despite, you know, irrespective of cash flow issues. And this, you know, is a main kind of prerogative of governments. They must provide certain services. Um, and in order to do that, they have to be able to make sure that money can get from point A to point B. Um, and the role of county governments, um, you know, our, that's kind of um, a point of discussion. I believe from my perspective, that the primary role of county governments is to convene stakeholders during this crisis. The county government is, you know, outward facing. We are responsible for sharing information um, with the public. The county is responsible for making, you know, coordinating with the business community about what their needs are. Um, they are responsible with working with their departments of public health to disseminate information about social distancing measures, about the number of COVID cases, uh, they're responsible for visualizing data, 
such, you know, such as kind of um, Ulster County's uh, COVID-19 dashboard. And they're kind of responsible for presenting a united front for their residents as to, you know, um, you know, being that bastion of trust. And from there, you know, the county must also distribute resources that they receive from the state or that they have equitably um, to the agencies that, you know, really need it. And that's kind of a very difficult situation because as we've seen in the previous slide with a massive contraction in local governments, the ability to provide non-mandated services, but services that people like, such as solid waste management, such as, um, you know, uh, I guess like it, it could be community events, um, all those services, um, you know, are facing kind of pressure due to the lack of cash flow. And finally, um, county governments, you know, their main role again, like I said in the previous slide, is to provide essential services, mandated services that uh, communities uh, need. And, um, you know, and that kind of going from there, the role of local governments, local governments, such as your town, your village, and your city, um, can be much more flexible and much more nimble in terms of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, the, one of the good things about Otsego County and our community in general is that we have a lot of intellectual capital here where we can figure out ways to adapt our community to a post-COVID-19 world. We have the ability to, you know, tap volunteers to innovate new solutions to um, addressing the issues ranging from parking to public transportation to the redesign of public spaces to the, um, you know, initiation of youth sports um, post COVID. And we can also innovate new ways in which to push energy efficiency initiatives, um, you know, climate resiliency initiatives, things that traditionally people have thought, you know, may or may not save money. But now um, with no idea being left off the table, we can kind of start making the case for a much more progressive approach to, um, you know, uh, urban and town planning uh, than was kind of, um, status quo before. And finally, uh, local governments play a key role in organizing um, people at each level of government to provide a steady stream of information, data, and assurance to uh, the public, um, you, know, at, you know, as can be possible during this time. And so what I mean by that is a lot of local leaders, you know, they know the people in their community, they have the ability to reach uh, many people that, you know, your county agency, that your state agency may not be able to reach. Um, local governments, you know, have to be that key connector piece between the public and um, the state and federal government and the county government to make sure that information flows appropriately. Um, a constituent of mine recently said that in times of crisis, it's important to over communicate. And I think that local governments can play a key role in over communicating uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the role of you know, the business community, uh, number one is to survive and then it's to thrive. Um, the mayor of Oneonta, Gary Herzig, you know, kind of took this moniker and made a committee you know, of city residents to um, tackle the economic recovery in Oneonta and to figure out how to market ourselves to a new um, population. Um, and so you know, businesses need help you know, meeting payroll, paying rent, um, you know, they need help kind of dealing with the decline in sales. And this is particularly, you know, important to think about, um, you know, because um, Otsego County does have a lot of retail establishments. Um, we've been facing a lot of pressure from the online retail sales and such, you know, from places like Amazon, um, et cetera. And that has been putting a dent in our retail market and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has, you know, exacerbated that pressure substantially. So the kind of the main priority for us is to figure out how we can help businesses tie themselves over so that they have a chance to adapt to a post COVID-19 world. Um, one approach to this could be to organize a support network for businesses to band together. Um, a common approach to doing this is the creation of a business improvement district, um, whereby a group of local business owners, usually within a similar geographic area, um, establish a nonprofit organization that um, you know, provides assist financial assistance or technical assistance or community beautification to small businesses and allows them to make investments that will drive foot traffic at a much faster speed than a city or town government could. 
Um, so for example, um, there are several business improvement districts in the city of New York that invest in services ranging from uh, sanitation to uh, community beautification to marketing and advertising. And they are able to make targeted investments in their neighborhood at a speed that is much faster than the city would be able to undertake on its own. And finally, the role of the business community is to innovate new ways and new technology to utilize private and public space to bring people together post COVID. Um, and the business community has a lot more flexibility and a lot more uh, nimbleness than government to come up with new approaches and new technology um, and new kind of ideas uh, for people to try out um, when it comes to you know, uh, a post COVID-19 world. And so, you know, for example, um, you know, designing low cost wireless adapters to be placed inside school buses, which can then help kids do their work from home if they don't have adequate Wi-Fi. Um, I've heard a lot of anecdotal stories of kids going to McDonald's to access the Wi-Fi um, or try to attend a class online. And by the time they connect, the class is over and their homework is overdue. Um, I think that the business community can play a key role in innovating new solutions and sharing in with local governments um, to address planning challenges. And finally, the um, role of the public, it's to get involved. You know, um, I'll point out in Otsego County, um, right now we have four full-time planners, um, but there are no professional planning staffs on, at the city or village or town level in our county. Um, and so a lot of place cities or towns or villages, when they want to update a comprehensive plan or update a zoning ordinance or write a grant, they rely on uh, contributions from members of the public like yourself um, or you know and and that means you have to get involved um, if you're an artist um, you could um, you know do a rendering of your town's main street um, you could kind of show them what redeveloping the main street looks like from an artistic perspective um, and that would save them thousands of dollars from hiring a, a landscape architect to do the same thing um, you could volunteer to um, you know, write parts of their uh, town comprehensive plan. Um, you could offer to um, host a community uh, discussion at your uh, business or office space about um, how your community bounces back from COVID. Um, or if you have the ability to um, provide, you know, engineering assistance, any sort of technical assistance to the municipality, that is always welcomed as well. Um, the second aspect is to remain, role is to remain engaged. Um, it can be, you know, kind of draining and tiring to read minutes from town meetings, um, but that's something that needs to happen. And this is, a, this is critical because a lot of the elected officials at the local level are people who volunteered for the position or who ran with a dedication to community service. And these are often people who are well-meaning, but don't have like a wide base knowledge in public administration, planning, economic development, so on and so forth. They rely on uh, members of the public, the business community, state and local governments um, to, um, uh, to provide you know, essential um, kind of like guidance. So you know, kind of what I mean by that is um, you know, the, if you have a volunteer supervisor and they're making a decision about what to do with your park in terms of renovating it, you know, they may have a, a pers their own perspective, but the perspective can be much improved and clarified by um, people like you who are engaged and involved in your uh, local government. And finally, you know, don't be afraid to contribute new ideas. Sometimes there's, um, you know, a, a fear that I've come across of whether or not uh, the idea for your community to be considered dumb or misguided or, you know, unintelligent. I think today during this time, ideas must come from everywhere and no idea should be considered dumb. The you know, community should be actively polling their residents for new ideas about how to adapt post COVID. That is going to be critical, um, especially if municipalities don't have the money to acquire expensive planning consultants. And so that said, you know, kind of um, what's next, you know, um, we'll need to redesign our community. And this is kind of a common um, you know, diagram uh, created in the building design and construction magazine in May, um, which kind of shows its future streetscape. And this is kind of stark, you know, you see um, you know, a marked uh, customer par uh, parking pickup zone outside for curbside pickup. You see socially 
uh, distanced um, sidewalk spaces uh, for lines on the right side of the screen. You see a, a walking lane on the street and you see parklets um, in areas of the street which allow people to socially distance and while sitting outside. And you also notice that you see median pedestrian signs which are intended to slow down traffic. And you know all of these kind of tweaks and changes can be made with you know some paint, some straw bales, um, some signs uh, that are pretty cheap, but the answer, you know, this doesn't necessarily pose, you know, a, a set in stone answer of what our communities will look like post COVID. Rather, this is kind of, you know, a sign of how we can use urban design to, um, you know, make people feel safe, you know, going to cities, going to your village centers, going to your town main street, and, you know, interacting in way, you know, um, in a way that it has a semblance to, you know, kind of um, the previous normal. And you know this, all this can be kind of done by you know members of the community and the business community. They can start thinking of ways in which to facilitate this process. Um, it's going to take people suggesting approaches and coming up with ideas to motivate um, local governments to plan um, this way. Uh, the reason being is that right now um, local governments are looking inward to and assessing the financial impact on their bottom line. And so that, that doesn't mean that planning can stop. It just means that everybody's gonna to have to pitch in to make it happen. And so kind of um, more um, broadly, uh, when it comes to redesigning our community, we wanna take advantage of flexible spaces. And so what do I mean by flexible spaces? Um, for those of you from the Oneana area, um, you could look at Roots Brewing Company, for example. That space, um, can be adapted for many different things as opposed to a, uh, you know, a bar and brewery. Um, you know, for example, um, certain places in New York City are, you know, a co-working space by day, they turn into a restaurant in the evening and then they turn into a bar at night. Um, you know, being able to change, you know, um, your use, you know, by the hour is going to be very important, you know, for communities to tap into or for businesses to tap into new revenue streams. And the important thing is to look at, um, you know, your zoning code. Does your town or village zoning code allow this type of thing to be done? Um, another flexible space is at your own house. Um, you know, many people in our community are entrepreneurs, they're uh, self-starters, they're business people. Um, they, but their zoning code does not allow them to set up an in-home business without a, a, a use variance. Um, and you know, uh, with the work from home culture being the way it is, you know, um, communities can you know allow home businesses to be set up or loosen restrictions on the uh, establishment of home businesses um, to market themselves to a telecommuting uh, population. Um, the next kind of thing when it comes to redesigning communities is to utilize tactical urbanism to make quick changes. And so, what do I mean by tactical urbanism? Um, I mean, you know, these are small investments that are done with paints, signs, straw bales, um, chalk, so on and so forth to, you know, make changes in your urban landscape um, that can, you know, uh, improve walkability, that can calm traffic, um, that can make your downtown more attractive to be in. Um, one example that I'll use is in order to slow down traffic on residential streets, uh, many communities across the United States are, are drawing uh, 3D crosswalks where the crosswalk appears elevated um, to, you know, uh, the eye of the driver and it forces people to slow down. Uh, some areas use straw bales and cones to create a temporary traffic circle to calm traffic in an, in an area. Um, and all these are approaches that don't cost a lot of money, but they can make changes both positive and negative to your community. So that said, it's important to always track these changes figure out what's working and then uh, let go of the things that aren't and prioritize the things that are working. Um, when it comes to redesigning our community, it's important to make sure that affordable housing is available to all. Um, and that means looking at things such as minimum lot size, allowable density, affordable housing requirements, inclusionary zoning, um, all aspects, all topics which involve kind of tweaking your zoning code to making sure that the cost of building new housing and renovating existing housing isn't cost prohibitive to people looking to live there. 
Um, one example that I'll use is uh, minimum parking requirements. Um, if you have an apartment complex that, that could house 60 people, you need to provide large amounts of free parking, off-site parking uh, to accommodate their need. And according to several peer-reviewed studies, um, minimum parking requirements have been shown to increase the price of housing development by nearly 20%. And that, you know, there's a book called The High Cost of Free Parking if you're interested in looking at those studies. And lastly, it's important to prioritize adaptive reuse. Um, if, if there are buildings in your village, town, uh, city, uh, county that you believe could be repurposed and renovated um, to kind of um, attract new business, attract housing, so on and so forth, it is really important to focus on prioritizing um, the adaptive reuse of building as opposed to new construction. Um, it, and this is kind of critical because, you know, you know, a lot of communities have assets, just historic buildings um, that are in need of renovation, but could be made to be really attractive. And it's critical to, you know, make sure that this, your zoning code allows for the changes in use, the, you know, waiving minimum parking requirements. So, you know, um, you know changes in height or density um, all of which that could allow the adaptive reuse of buildings. Um, so, you know, one of the key things to do is to look at your zoning code and say, I want to build, you know, I want to have home businesses in this neighborhood. Can I do that? And you look at your zoning code and to see whether or not yes or no. And then you as a citizen can propose the change um, to that. And that's something that, you know, many of you can do uh, with the fact that zoning codes and local planning documents are mostly online. Um, if they're not online, you can acquire them through a Freedom of Information Act request, or hopefully your town clerk can print them out for you. And then, you know, um, what's next? You know, we want to redesign our public spaces. Um, Otsego County and, you know, and communities throughout uh, the United States across both the urban and suburban sphere are um, very, uh, you know, are very car centric. Their streets have high design speeds um, that allow people to go much faster than the speed limit. So a common refrain that I hear at a lot of municipal meetings is that, hey, someone's going 50 miles an hour down my residential street um, and, and they're not obeying the speed limit. There's argument, an argument to be made in the plan, you know, in kind of the realm of planners is to say, okay, well, look, let's see, you know, how wide that street is, what speed is it designed for? Um, and then kind of implement changes that make that design speed slow enough to where people, you know, are forced to drive slow. And so one kind of, um, you know, thing to kind of put that into context is that there are, I think there, the city of Oslo in um, Norway, um, I think I think it's them. And you have to forgive me if I'm mistaken. Um, they um, made their design speeds of their streets much slower. Um, to like down to like 30 or 25 miles an hour and to and they've uh, successfully avoided um, pedestrian deaths um, and made their streets a lot safer for multi multiple forms of transportation. So, you know, in your community, you know, if people are going to be walking or biking or can't drive or have to work from home, it's important that we slow our streets down to allow people to walk in the street, allow people to ride their bike, allow people to, you know, maybe push their stroller across the street um, and limit uh, speeding in, you know, in rural communities, um, this could mean that, you know, you'd want to slow your streets down in your hamlet centers. Um, you'd want to make it so that people, if there are no sidewalks that, you know, you can create, you know, a safe space for people to walk along the shoulder by, you know, putting cones or some other feature out uh, there that slows uh, vehicle traffic down or maybe moves them away uh, from the shoulder. Um, another thing to think about is that you know, a lot of your streets, um, are, you know, adjacent to restaurants or sidewalks adjacent to restaurants can be redesigned for outdoor seating uh, for a relatively cheap price. Um, but that would require you to take away uh, vehicle park, um, uh, street side vehicle parking. And uh, outdoor seating is really popular. Um, you know, you would, you'd, in this picture on the right, you'll see a, a basic design for a parklet. This is a space that um, was formerly curbside parking but now has been turned into outdoor seating for uh, working professionals, members of the public, restaurateurs, so on and so forth. Um, and that can be you know, a way in which to bring people down to your main street in a socially responsible way while maintaining the six foot uh, distancing guidelines 
Um, but in order to do so, you would have to kind of take up your parking real estate. Um, finally, you know, you know uh, working with your business community to arrange curbside pickup. Um, one of the good things about having an organized business community is that they can kind of work together to coordinate pickup at the curbside. So allow people to pull up, walk up, um, bike up and pick up what they need and then move forward. But in order to do that, you need fast circulation of you know, both people and cars um, you know, to accomplish this. And um, you know, again, you know, long-term free parking is kind of a barrier to you know, effective fast circulation. And finally, last but not least, if you have a vacant lot or an area that is kind of maybe a house that was knocked down, turning them into mini parks or mini green spaces can provide a lot of benefit in terms of community uh, cohesiveness, mental health, um, improvements and you know a sense of you know bringing people outside. Um, you know there's in the Mohawk Valley there's an entity called the Mohawk Valley Land Bank, um, and uh, they take you know properties and redevelop them or knock them down so they can put on the tax roll. And one of the things that they do if they take a property down is they could allow for the creation of a, a mini park. Um, and so. Um, I think that you know those kind of ideas are um, you know really important to push, um, but again they require the push to come from um, if the planners or the local governments don't think of them they require you know they need to come from members of the public, and it could be a phone call to an elected official, it could be you showing up at a meeting, it could be you know if you have a you know person who can draw you drawing a, a rendering of what that could look like. Um, I really think that you know. Uh, redesigning public spaces are kind of best initiated by the members of the public who are using it. And so, you know, kind of what's next? Um, and, you know, we want to talk about enhancing resiliency. And so, you know, in environmental kind of policy circles, we talk about the triple bottom line, your economic well-being, your environmental quality being maximized, and the social uh, fabric of your community being strong. Um, with those who are vulnerable being able to access the services that they need. And this will force, this idea will hopefully force municipalities to think about the triple bottom line. Ultimately, when you're asking your town, city, village, county, state government to do something that is conscious, you know, forward thinking in a planning space or an environmental conservation space or in an energy policy space, they need money. Their budgets need to be healthy. So when we think about economic well-being, it's not just the economic well-being of the community, it's also the economic well-being of your municipality. Do they have sufficient funds to um, you know, uh, upgrade their culverts to design sizes that are suitable uh, to accommodate increased uh, uh, flows from climate change? Are they able to, do they have the people or staff necessary to kind of participate in the New York State you know, Climate Smart Communities uh, program? Do they have, you know, do they have the ability to write grants that can help business owners, um, you know, apply for grants? Um, do they have people, do they know who to contact um, and how to, and can they meet match requirements when organizations uh, throughout Otsego County offer them grants that require a local match? Um, so that is a really important thing. And, you know, looking at municipal budgets can sometimes seem like Greek to people, but I really think that, you know, getting an explanation, understanding um, municipal budgets could be something that members of the public do in, in order to help your town and your community bounce back from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, looking at environmental quality, both the built and natural environment. So what I mean by the built environment is you want to look at your roads, your houses, your buildings, and you want to see if it's, you know, aesthetically appealing and kind of uh, cohesive enough to kind of make you feel at ease, you know, with where you live. And what I mean by that is, you, you know, if you go to an area, if you're a teenager and your town has nowhere for you to gather after school, that's a problem with the built environment, you know, in your community. Or if you have streets that people drive too fast on or there's congestion in a certain area, those are impacts to your built community. The and then when looking at the natural side, um, you know, when, as we redevelop, we don't want to throw, you know, caution to the wind. We want to make sure that new development is approved that is environmentally protective, that is cost efficient, and that also reduces our carbon footprint. And so again, that requires deep involvement from not only local governments and their city staff, 
but it also requires deep involvement from members of the public and nonprofit organizations alike. And social well-being and equity within your community. I think that every organization, every member of the public, everybody should be trying to get involved in your community to make it a better, good place to live and help people realize and remember what about their community that they truly enjoy and appreciate. Um, you know, the social infrastructure in your community um, could range from providing services to the elderly to, all, you know, going to your local library to your local park, um, making sure that um, people are able to take advantage of those services, that your neighbors are able to make it through okay. I think that is going to be really, really important in, in terms of enhancing uh, the real resiliency of our community. And so, you know, that said, well, like, you know, how do we do that? Um, you know, and the author, you know, this kind of, um, I guess, executive director of an organization called Strong Towns, Chuck Marone, has this kind of four-step uh, approach to making targeted investments in your community. And the first step is you want to identify where people struggle going about their daily routine. Um, one thing that I, you know, like to recommend um, to people is like if you are tasked with developing a plan for your community or if you are in a position of authority locally, um, you know, see if you can follow your friends as they go about their business across the day, ask them what they have trouble with, what, you know, is good about your community, what is bad. You know, sometimes it involves shadowing them as they walk to work or watching them drive 45 minutes to the grocery store. Um, you know, but really kind of trying to shadow people as they go about their daily routine and see where they struggle and figure out what kind of solutions can be implemented to mitigate that struggle. And so uh, the next step involves identifying the next smallest thing that can be done today to address that struggle. So Chuck Marone uses an example of a single mother who is pushing a stroller along the side, you know, an arterial street that does not have a sidewalk and has a relatively narrow shoulder. And he says, okay, you know, how can we protect her um, from, you know, having to push her stroller in the ditch or how can we, you know, protect her from fear of an automobile hitting her and her children? Um, the approach that was utilized, you know, involved kind of, you know, what, you know, creating a wide shoulder space using, you know, straw bales and other features to make sure that vehicle, tra uh, vehicle traffic did not um, crowd uh, the, an area where people are walking. And so to put that into perspective, if we look at Lettuce Highway, uh, we know that people uh, in Oneonta, we know that people walk across there to go to the south side to work and to buy stuff. Um, you know, we need to think about what is the cheapest thing that we can do to slow down vehicle traffic and give people a sense of safety and security walking there um, walking to Southside to go to their jobs or to buy products. And then once we've identified that solution is to do it and do it right away. Um, you know, I think that um, if the uh, debate is warranted in making implementing these decisions, but undue obstruction and delays and studies are not, um, if there's a small tweak that you can do uh, to your community to make it a safer place, it's important to try it out and gather data to measure its effectiveness rather than to hiring a study to estimate its effectiveness. And finally, when you find things that work, uh, repeat the process. And lastly, but not least, it's to use a hacker mindset. You know, any idea, you know, is on the table, you know. They don't have to come from people with high planning pedigrees or strong engineering pedigrees. They can come from people with practical common sense approaches to solving problems. And oftentimes, um, you know, I benefited from people, you know, stopping me and bringing me down to earth and telling me to focus on, you know, a common sense basic or hacker approach um, to a problem that I've been struggling with uh, for many months. And so, um, you know, kind of what else can we do? We can, um, you know, make those small targeted investments and to keep trying, you know, if something doesn't work, it doesn't mean give up and go back to the status quo. It means trying the next idea and coming up with something again. And, you know, this involves, you know, becoming okay in a sense with uh, failure. So you see here, um, you know, these are, you know, uh, one is a parklet that I was talking about where people are able to gather in the middle of a former, you know, uh, you know, downtown um, in a heavy, heavily car trafficked area. Um, you know, these ideas, you know, are often evaluated for their effect efficacy with respect to safety, with respect to visitorship and maintenance. But the idea is, you know, it would still be a car clogged area if the idea weren't tried in the first place. The 3D crosswalk idea, you know, 
that is something that you know was kind of tried and evaluated and then was shown to kind of succeed. So a lot of other places are trying it in their you know, municipalities. And so kind of what does this you know, all mean is that if, we, if somebody is trying a creative approach, it is incumbent upon all of us to ask those you know, who are doing it, how did they do it? Can you teach us what you've done? How do we learn more? And you'll see that people are more than not, not, uh, more than not willing to share their approaches with you. And as Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. And so finally, um, what can we do? You know, we have to be able to objectively evaluate our um, uh, kind of economic development and community planning approaches. So this means having clear, easy access to the data. Um, you wanna be able to gather data effectively. You wanna be able to kind of uh, collect it and organize it. Um, and you want to be able to know where to get information. So if you're looking for information about the total uh, square footage of commercial space in your uh, town or village, you should, you know, there should be a place that is easily reachable that has that information. And so you also want to be able to organize um, information for your municipality in one spot. Um, and so the city of London in England has a pretty good website where they try to amass as much municipal data as they can in one spot. Um, that, you know, well, not, you know, they don't have every single data set, but they have links to data sets that you can find by going to that central landing page. And that's really important. If we're talking about redesigning and redeveloping our communities and making targeted investments, we have to know where to get the data that can help us make those targeted investments. We can't just make them, you know, off the seat of our pants, um, even though, um, you know, sometimes, you know, you have to do that. So, you know, an example of this, um, in New York City, there was a uh, open source um, kind of uh, website set up where people uh, studied the width of sidewalks to see if sidewalks could accommodate social distancing. So in the picture below, you see uh, New York City, and you see a series of colors uh, where the sidewalks are. Blue and green represent sidewalks in which social distancing can occur, blue being the most optimal. Um, orange, yellow, and red sidewalks represent areas where social distance, you know, walking while maintaining a six foot um, distance, uh, you know, from a social, dis social distancing perspective is difficult, if not impossible. And so, you know, this study can help, um, you know, planners and engineers and transportation officials um, make investments in, you know, key targeted areas in their city to make, um, you know, sidewalks more safe for people wanting to social distance. Um, and so kind of what can we do? Um, it's important to be a convener. Um, you know, the main kind of thing that the public needs to do is they, you have to be able to bring people together. And that involves reimagining public engagement. Um, if you have an idea of how the public can interact and uh, contribute in planning decisions, it's important to share it. And as planners, it's our role to kind of uh, figure out ways in which we can access a lot of people through interactive polling, screen sharing, etc. There should be no reason why uh, members of the public can't see a site plan that is done via screen share, where people can run numbers and do analysis, you know, while sharing their screen, so that people can see where they get the data from. Um, and lastly, it's important to volunteer and get involved in your community. Um, I cannot stress that enough. Um, get volunteering and getting involved you know, even though you have a full-time job and family obligations, or, you know, it's really difficult, I get it, um, but it, it's gonna take us all coming together and all putting in the extra hours to bounce back from the COVID-19 pandemic. And last, you know, last but not least, it's important to kind of rethink planning as an opportunity rather than an obstacle. We don't wanna look at a zoning regulation and think, oh my God, this is just all red tape. We should be looking at a zoning regulation in our downtowns as an opportunity to do better. Um, what can we do to fix it? How can we solve the problem of an economic decline and mitigate uh, this impact economic crisis to the greatest extent possible? Um, you know, it can be easy to go into a, a cycle of doom and gloom, but I really believe that um, if we think of it as an opportunity uh, rather than an obstacle in terms of address, uh, fighting the crisis and addressing it, um, I think that we'll be better off mentally um, as well as, um, you know, kind of economically. And so um, OCCA does have a series of online planning classes. We realize that we can't do a lot of our outreach that we normally do. I can't go to your town board meetings or village board meetings um, in person. So 
we're setting up a series of online planning classes where people can get um, continuing education cer um, certificates. Um, and, you know, and if you're interested in signing up for those classes, please email me at planner at occainfo.org to sign up. And so what's included? We have courses on comprehensive planning. Um, we have more in-depth courses in the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act. And we have uh, classes on zoning as well as environmental planning topics. Um, we can make special classes. If you have a group of people who wanna learn about a specific topic, I'd be happy to design classes that fit your needs. And um, you know, day to day, OCCA has a circuit writer planner program that kind of assist communities with their planning needs. OCCA um, accounts uh, accommodates 50% of the consulting fee that we normally charge uh, to make sure that municipalities have the best deal possible when it comes to, um, you know, uh, implementing plans, especially if they can't afford to hire um, expensive consulting firms. And then we also offer a wide range of other training opportunities, um, as you see below. And so that said, I wanted to thank you for taking the time out of your day to attend this webinar, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you.